Ay. Ay gata o ishan ve çekti cehen ne güzel. We're ready to begin our first uh, session of the morning. So we do want to let you know that I know the tables are filling up. There's a few empty spaces up here at the front table if you're brave to sit up here at the front. Otherwise, there's just chairs at the back. If you want to move and squeeze in at a table, that's fine too. So, um, but anyway, look around and see if you can find a table um, to sit at. So we're ready to begin our session uh, this morning. And the will of what you might stop to start to visit Jachim of the Nakokia Data Ia Tono Ata Majurga, which Jachim at your half at Kikum with the Bosachim Chim at the Majurgic Achim here. She took him on the Nakokia Data Yaha Ia Mo Yaha Ki Wusakamabaga or Adam Chim Hugam Mahu Pagimabaga Juchkum Hajurdika Bamamata Adam Hajurdika Hikokoi Amjit Wusi Chachi much of thirty to much much Sakta had the me only him a week skirk checked at the Monta Nakokia Tata Ia. Ia baup chukrona monta nakokia tata mo ba but autumn had you with the kaia. Tamjit ia the daka kana macha makudma, much baps silky mumtia tata ia. I am chugging Ophelia Sapeda to have chip kaia, either daka kana macha makudma baga University of Arizona, Hakada mo baga Department of Linguistics, Tamjitake Mukmurchi to much baga American Indian Language Development Institute. And the Babia am the team I at on autumn had you to go to the board and bow. So it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here, and we're very happy that you joined us um, here at, of course, um, the land of the Thon Autumn. This is our traditional uh, land, our traditional home here in this part of Arizona, which also extends into Sonora, Mexico. So I offer you welcome as a member of the Autumn Nation to um, this part of the country. Also, I wanna welcome all of you to the University of Arizona, those of you who um, are just now coming for our, our little conference. Um, my name is Ophelia Cepeda, and I'm faculty in the Department of Linguistics and also the director of the American Indian Language Development Institute. So on behalf of our campus and my two um, units, I want to uh, offer uh, a welcome to all of you. So I'm very, very happy that you're here. It's very nice to see lots of old friends and also meet new ones. And uh, we're all looking forward to um, you know, a wonderful day today and of course um, another one tomorrow. So we have lots of things um, that are going to be happening, lots of sharing. So the only thing that I want to say with regard to the program, and I'll say a little bit about it too through uh, afterwards, um, is just the title. We're not going to go into any detail because we did write a little introduction in, in your program, just visiting the state of indigenous languages, language revitalization. And so that is a main theme for the next two days. So as we begin our session, I'd like to invite my friend and my relative, um, one of our ALDI participants, mm -hmm. to come and do a, a blessing for you. And this is Miss um, Joyce Hughes, also known as Arlene Hughes. <laughs> so if, she, if you could. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay, just before um, we start with our first session, I do want to um, um, just mention to all of you in attendance that if you have any questions, we have our staff and our volunteers over here at the registration table. And of course, I want to acknowledge our, our small staff that we have in the American Indian Language Development Institute office. Right now, we're all very busy because we are in the middle of our language institute. This is um, a very busy time uh, for them and for all of our participants who are here today. So of course, um, our regular staff in the office includes uh, Alice Sadonge, our coordinator, and also uh, Audrey Hamilton, our um, admin assistant, and uh, Adrienne Tikewa, our graduate 
no longer graduate, I'm sorry, our, our uh, staff uh, in the office. Um, so they're all here throughout the day. So if you need, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel, uh, please feel free to, uh, to call on them. Uh, we'll have other announcements and housekeeping things, but um, I'll, I'll get to some of that uh, a little bit later after our first presentation, because we'll have a, a break after that one. So it is certainly um, my pleasure um, to welcome uh, with uh, all the, the years that I've been in uh, language work and so forth, um, and been around, particularly the U.S. Uh, over this period of time, uh, we we've never met, and but I've known of Daryl for for many many years, and all of the wonderful work that he's been doing, and particularly with his family, and then of course his own community. I think the work that uh, Daryl and many of the people that are presenting today. And then all of you that are here as participants, you know, this is sort of, uh, of course, certainly the focus of many of your, your work currently. And I know for many of you, it is the focus of your lives. Those of uh, us who are still speakers of the language, that's all, you know, that we um, bring to this whole effort of, of language work. And throughout, as I mentioned, the next couple of days, we are going to be looking at different questions, different issues, um, different challenges, and also what the future holds in regards to language revitalization efforts. And as our literature um, discusses, that's in your um, program, is the baseline that we're starting with is with the uh, passage of the Native American Languages Act back, the original one in 1990, and then um, the uh, one that was passed in 1992, the one that has funding attached to it. And, uh, and I know the ANA uh, grants deadline just went by, or maybe, yeah, just went by in early June of, of this month. And uh, so many of you are aware of the ANA granting funds. So that's, those things are all tied together as far as the way that we're going to be talking about some of these um, topics and themes for the next couple of days. But our first speaker is going to be uh, Mr. Daryl Baldwin. And it's a true honor, as I said, for me to meet Daryl uh, for the first time and to have him be our keynote speaker this morning. Daryl also has the distinction of being our first uh, speaker under a very nice little uh, lecture series that we created here through our American Indian Language Development Institute and also the Department of Linguistics. And that is um, a lecture series that we named the Kenneth Hale Memorial Lecture Series. And for those of you that don't know Kenneth Hale, Kenneth Hale was a very um, important linguist to many of us who worked on Native American languages, uh, especially um, about 1960, 1970, and then when he passed away uh, in the 1990s. Um, but he was um, significant in some of the early language documentation, especially of Southwest languages. He also worked on languages of South America and particularly languages of, well, particular language of Australia uh, and then others throughout the United States. But he was faculty at MIT um, and retired from there, but actually he lived most of his childhood and early, early years here in Tucson in the southern part of uh, Arizona, uh, ranching and cowboy country. And for those of you who knew Ken Hale, you knew that he was, um, buried in his boots. He always wear cowboy boots, um, no matter what the occasion. Um, so it's um, fitting that we have this nice uh, memoriam because of his work and his influences. And uh, for many of us, like I said, his, his, um, the things that he did uh, continues to be influential today. And um, Anyway, so the, the, that memorial uh, talk is 
it's to this institute, or excuse me, yeah, the institute and this little conference is the, the inauguration of that particular series. Also, that particular series of lectures will come with it um, a fundraising event, and all the funds that we raise uh, with each of those lectures will be um, will benefit the Aldi uh, scholarship <clears throat> scholarship fund. So. Uh, we all think it's all worthwhile, and uh, when we checked with his family, um, they were very um, uh, agreeable that it was a worthwhile effort and that we were allowed to use his name uh, for this event. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our, our first speaker, um, <clears throat> Mr. Daryl Baldwin, and Daryl comes to us. Uh, from a little, I think a little bit cooler part of the, the country. Uh, Daryl is uh, the Miami tribe, um, and uh, he has, I think, going to give us a, a wonderful uh, presentation of his work. And Daryl's work, when I first heard about it, was when he was um, working with uh, his family, his children, uh, revitalizing, bringing back um, the Miami language primarily through his own family and is, has expand, expanded uh, from that point on into what is, um, I think, a very viable and exciting uh, effort and a, a really unique example of language revitalization because it always starts small. It always starts with an individual with a dream and a goal. and. Um, when it's good, when it works, people join and people will help. And I think that's what's happened with, with his uh, efforts. So we're going to hear about all of that uh, this morning. So let me go ahead and allow Daryl to come up and um, join us. Please give a nice welcome to Daryl Baldwin, please. My name is Daryl and I'm very, very honored. This is my first visit to Aldi. I've heard of Aldi many, many times and I'm very impressed with the commitment and the work that they've been carrying out. And I'm also really motivated when I look out at an audience and I see an intergenerational audience. Because this is really about communities. And our communities are defined not by any one age bracket, but by all of us together, both the young and the old. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really encouraged to see uh, so much intergeneration here. I want to start by uh, thanking the organizing committee for inviting me. I don't get many opportunities to visit this part of the country. Uh, my wife and I came a little bit early just so that we could see the landscape and get out on the land a little bit. And it really reminds me of um, how place-based our cultures and languages are. It was really challenging for my wife and I to speak in the language because there's so many things we didn't have words for, especially cactuses. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge the Tana Autumn and the Oskwayaki uh, nations whose homelands were on here today. And I apologize if I didn't do a good job of pronouncing those. I flew here from DC where we're in the middle of holding uh, our second biennial national version of Breath of Life. And it's a work, uh, language workshop that's being held at the National Museum of the American Indian. Breath of Life began in 1995 at the University of California, Berkeley. And since that time, these workshops have spread to locations such as the Sam Noble Museum in Oklahoma City, NMAI in DC, and the University of Washington. There's a reason this program is spreading and becoming more important to Indian country. It's because more tribes are entering that dormant language stage. Breath of Life is an important training resource 
for community language activists that helps connect them to language documentation so they may begin the long and difficult process of reclaiming their languages. As communities who have lost their speakers, we are a growing number and some of us have been quietly working with our languages for many years as we lay the foundational pieces for a broader language effort for our future. Our languages are not dead, nor are they extinct. They are simply waiting for a time when the community is ready to start breathing life into them again and are willing to accept the changes that come with such an effort. To that end, the topic of language reclamation is fitting for this year's ALDI theme, Revisiting the State of Indigenous Languages. Because I come from a community that lost its speakers in the early 1960s, my presentation will reflect on what is now a 20-year effort at foundation building. I will start by giving you a brief historical context and then follow with three core elements of our effort. And then I will finish with three important outcomes in an attempt to demonstrate what's emerging from our work. To do this, I've chosen to use the following image as a metaphoric expression of our overall effort. This image was taken during one of our Awan Zapata youth programs a couple of years ago. There were several things in this image that really resonated with me. Positioned on the left is a rising sun. In our language, we express this term with Awan Zapata which you may recognize as the name of our youth program. For many of us, the efforts at language reclama reclamation signify a new day, an awakening, and we connect this notion of transition with our youth. The lodge in the middle was constructed by our language students. That particular year, the theme was Kikanana, our homes. We wanted to make the connection between homes of the past and our homes of the present. The message being that a home is still a home, regardless of the change in structure over time. What makes that home Miamia is what takes place within it and the knowledge of those who reside there. The image of the traditional lodge has come to stand for a model for our broader tribal educational efforts. Each lodge pole represents an important foundational value in our philosophical understanding of teaching and learning. The silhouette view of the image reminds me of the dark period we are emerging from. The day is not yet full, nor is the lodge finished. It's only a beginning point in time, and our progress at this moment even after 20 years, still feels like a beginning for me personally. You will also notice throughout the presentation images of cranes, or more specifically, Chachawa, the Sandhill Crane. Historically, this was an important clan, and other tribes referred to us in their own languages as the Crane people. Over time, this has become the symbol of the Miamia Nation today, I've used emerging cranes to symbolize the important outcomes I will share at the end of my presentation. As I prepared for this particular talk, I found it really challenging. There are lots of moving parts and moving pieces uh, in our effort, a growing effort that, as Ophelia uh, mentioned, began in my home. Uh, began with a personal interest that I had through the collaboration of my wife and I to attempt to raise our children with the language, a very difficult task without speakers, because what that meant is that I would have to learn my language from documentation. And so that's a very, very different process, very different process, mm -hmm. one that takes considerably longer uh, than any immersion attempt. And since we've just recently kind of reached our 20-year mark, we found ourselves in the last year reflecting 
on what's all transpired. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to share with you uh, some of what we've learned from that. For those of you that know me, you know I can be very candid. Um, I don't particularly like to sugarcoat things very much. Um, I'm a bit of a realist. Um, it has to make sense to me and it has to work. I'm not afraid to make mistakes. Um, I think all of that leads to successes. As a community, we are being successful. What makes us successful is how we define success, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. As communities, you have the right to define your own successes. But before I really get into that, it's important that I give you a historical context. Knowing our history is important in understanding community demographics and contemporary language ideologies. Understanding past events and colonizing forces have led to language shifts, helps our community language educators strategize and develop appropriate responses. You can always tell a Mac user when they get up here. <laughs> We don't have a word for history in our language. is how we express that concept. It just basically means how we talk about our lives. Linguists like to, when they look at languages, look at tenses like past, present, and future. And certainly our language has been described in those terms. But after years of teaching, we've come to realize that our language is trying to teach us something very important. Our ancestors didn't necessarily construct time in a sense of past, present, and future. From what our language is telling us, they tended to group things into what is known and what is unknown. The past and the present all being part of the same realm of the known. Our original homelands encompass what is now the states of Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, up into the lower portions of Michigan, and Wisconsin. It was a shared landscape. Many, many tribes claimed that same area as part of their traditional homelands as well. And over time, that area was negotiated and used by many different groups, even groups passing through. After 13 treaties, our ancestors were forced to sign an 1840 treaty which called for their forced relocation. They didn't want to go. They didn't sign the treaty with any intention of going. They thought they would be able to stay. But in October of 1846, an army showed up and at gunpoint put them on canal boats. The canal system was in place at that time. And they began their long journey west. They took the canal system over into the Ohio country and took the Miami Erie Canal system down to what today is Cincinnati, passing by an institution that existed at that time, right about here, a place called Miami University, and I'll come back to that. Those canal boats went by that institution probably at a time there were classes going on because Miami University was chartered in 1809 and they began holding classes right around 1825. After they got down to Cincinnati, they took steamships down the Ohio River, all the way over to what's near what is now Kansas City. They walked the last 50 miles, and here is where they would reside. They arrived in November. So for at least the first couple of years, they were completely dependent on the food and shelter uh, of the United States federal government. They weren't there very long. And there were other tribes that joined them in that entire region. This whole area was not yet the state of Kansas. It was considered the unorganized territory. By the 1850s, Kansas became a state. And by the 1870s, our ancestors found themselves again in the, in the way of this thing called progress. And sometime in the 1870s, they relocated again to northeast Oklahoma, which is where our seat of tribal government resides today. During all of that, we experienced community fragmentation. Segments of the community remained back in Indiana, remained back in Kansas, 
and some went to Oklahoma. During that time, our tribal lands began to be allotted. We lost the reservation in Kansas. By the time we got to Oklahoma, we were residing on allotment lands. Through the depression and the mining period, much of that land was sold. It came out, came out of the possession of individuals. And by the early 1900s, the tribe had no communal land base. In Oklahoma, we don't really have reservations. We have jurisdictional areas. And within those jurisdictional areas is how we define where we do business and how we provide services to tribal members. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that of fragmentation. It was during this period also that we began to experience the boarding school era. Elders both liked the boarding school, but also recognized that the boarding school took much of our language and culture. Many of the elders that are in their 80s say that without the skills they learned at the boarding school, they would not have been able to provide for their families. So although we recognize the damage that the boarding school era did, uh, it also provided opportunities, job opportunities for tribe members. But regardless, it was a period of loss. It should be no surprise then that today, we have poor populations. Testing, okay. It should be of no surprise today that we have poor populations here around the headquarters area, up in the old reservation in Kansas, and also up in the homeland. That's a real demographic challenge for language reclamation work. And then I've got a dot here for Miami University so you can see the relationship here. Removals, fragmentation, family isolation within the mainstream, and largely what is today an urban population. A quarter of our tribal population we're just over 4,000 members reside in these areas and we have members that now reside in every state within the United States. So with that said, I wanna first, I wanna first touch on the notion of research. Research has become a very, very important aspect to what we do. I would like to say that, that we're fully capable of leading our own research and development efforts and taking leadership roles in determining the most appropriate response to community needs. For the longest time, we had researchers involved in our communities. They were doing research for a variety of reasons, but not much of that was really benefiting us. And I heard the complaints from community members and at one point, I think we began to really think, well, why aren't we the researchers? We can be the researchers. And so we began to engage in that. The important parts of research for us is that of inquiry. You have to start asking questions. You have to get into the archives. You have to work with information that elders still know. A lot of people say that when the language goes, so does the culture. That's not true. Culture is damaged, but culture can survive in the absence of language. Whether you're making baskets, collecting traditional foods, those are all cultural activities. And those are things that persisted in our community in the absence of language. So when we began language revitalization or reclamation work, it was important for us to tap into what elder knowledge was still available to us because they were pieces of the puzzle that we were trying to put back together for our community. We also learned during this period that we had a massive amount of language documentation, documentation that spans 275 years. We began transcribing and translating these documents in 1988, and we've utilized about 30%. So the amount of materials that we have to work with uh, are extensive, and they span an interesting time. 
late 1600s, early 1700s, the Jesuit period, very extensive documents, all the way up to when linguists started working with our community right around 1900. And then there's some minor pieces that occur after that up to the last speakers passed in the 1960s. But one of the things that jumps out to us is the amount of change that occurs in that period of time. We can actually observe change in terms of the language grammar and structure, the semantics, the meaning shifts, cultural shifts. We can see all of those things uh, in the records. It's, it's actually quite fascinating. So a very important lesson, change. Change is relevant, and that challenged us against notions of authenticity. We had to be careful about how we handled notions of authenticity in a culture that was obviously changing and had to change if it was gonna survive. We also took the time to get into museum archives, become familiar with what material objects were from the past, how they fit into the living knowledge and the documented knowledge. Again, trying to bring all those pieces back. The team of people were primarily driven by tribal members, trained in a variety of fields, linguistics, anthropology, elders who come with their own extensive training, their own PhDs, and also people that we trusted, people that were not from the community that we had long associations with. And that research team still largely exists, pretty much intact today even though it's grown. It also became important that we started to look back at ourselves as this process was happening. We learned a lot about ourselves, working with ourselves, working with our heritage materials, working with our community. And as children, we're starting to be exposed to the language at an early age, primarily in the home. It was important for us to begin to learn about their learning process. How were they conceptualizing their language? Could they construct new forms on their own? There was a bunch of questions that started to come up. How did it fit into their identity? And so over the years, we've had three dissertations written on various aspects of our effort. This particular one is pictured here with uh, my youngest daughter, Amakunza, and Wesley Leonard, who's a tribal member. He was working on his dissertation in linguistics, and what, what he was looking at was how children learn language in the home, in, in our context. I would say that this was kind of a fragile time for us. I don't know that I would have let an outsider, somebody that wasn't a part of our community, come and work with my children in the home the way that uh, we allowed Uncle Wes to do that. So one of the ways that we set this up, because we are in fact kin and from the same tribal community, what we did is we charged the children with teaching Uncle Wes how to speak Miamia. Uncle Wes is gonna come to the house and while he's here, he wants to learn to speak Miamia. Will you guys teach him? So that was the model that we set up. And so children started to take a leadership role in teaching. And it's something new for a lot of our communities that actually the young people uh, can be the, uh, the teachers. And so that worked very, very well. We're still working on that process, that assessment process, mm -hmm. and learning from it. I think the other thing involved in research that really uh, nudged us along was that we needed to start to get involved. And what I mean by that is, you can study a language, you can look at it, you can speak it, you can learn all about it, but if you're not practicing it, and I'm not just talking about the verbal aspects of it, the cultural aspects of it, then it doesn't have much of a context. So language reclamation, revitalization, really forced us to get out of the materials, out of the classrooms, even out of the house, and start practicing our culture, using the language to reinforce that whether we were trying to locate, harvest, and prepare traditional plants, or doing what our ancestors had done for many years was look up at the sky, the sky being part of our landscape. And that one aspect of our landscape that has changed very little since their time.
The next important aspect I'd like to touch on is the notion of education. You're going to notice throughout this presentation I talk about language, but language is not directly focused on. And I'll come back to that in a little bit as to why. Public education, including BIA-funded schools, are designed to make good American citizens out of its students. That's what they do. There's nothing wrong with preparing our children to be contributing members of the global society and for them to achieve success and prosperity. But if the educational experience means they have to give up their unique tribal identities due to a subtractive form of education, then we as tribal nations will ultimately lose them to the mainstream. I believe this is true because for a community like ours, that process is further along and we see the damaging effects it has on our future as a distinct people. The Miami tribe of Oklahoma has determined it vitally necessary to begin building a tribal educational infrastructure so that tribal educators can be involved in the long-term education of youth. At this stage of our development, we're focused on three initiatives, training teachers, home education, community youth programs. Somebody asked me once if we could be sovereign if we couldn't feed ourselves and we, couldn't, and we didn't educate our own children. And I think there's an important question there. We have to be present for the education of our youth. Nobody's going to teach them about how to be Mia Mia. Only we can do that. With, that's easier said than done. Over the years, we've learned that our real focus has to be education has to be education. And that begins with just simply first, what does the community want? Is the community interested in supporting a tribal educational initiative? I differentiate Indian education from tribal education. Tribal education is where we control the content, we're teaching about ourselves. For the longest time, the community received messages from lots of different directions. The goal in life is to get the kids educated. Send them to school, get them educated. Education is everything. We believe in education. And that's true. There's nothing wrong with that. But does that mean minus being able to speak your language? Knowing your culture, understanding your community dynamics, understanding your tribal leadership roles, all of those sorts of things. Those have to be taught now. It doesn't happen naturally. That became apparent to me when a young uh, tribal member could almost name all the presidents of the United States but didn't know who their former chief was. That was a problem. So it really made us think about the fact that what we're really dealing with here is an education issue. First step in that is what the community wants. Some communities aren't ready. I wouldn't say that our community was ready for this 20 years ago. They are ready today, but they weren't then. It's taken us a long time to help them understand why tribal education is important. Training teachers, there is no one to really teach, and we have to take that responsibility on. We have to train teachers. And it's one thing to train about methodologies in teaching language. That's very useful, we need to have that. But then there's the cultural knowledge that has to be taught as well. So those two things have to come together. I think probably one of the biggest challenges for us is the realization that our language is not a thing. It's not like a basket. It's not a thing you can preserve. It's an expression. What is it an expression of? It's an expression of a knowledge system. What is that knowledge system? What does that knowledge system contain? So when we revitalize our languages, we have to revitalize the knowledge system. Some pieces of that knowledge system won't be applicable today. Some will. There'll be lots of changes in how 
our ancestors were raised and thought and how our young people think and believe today. All of that requires us in an educational context to start developing educational models by which we would teach from. We don't have a word for religion. We don't have words for history. We don't have an expression that's equivalent to the English expression of being outside. That says something about how we construct our world, how we understand our world. So here we are in an unnatural situation having to teach those concepts. And the models that we create, the teaching models that we create through the language allow us to do that. But it takes time. It takes a lot of time to, to work through and to try to determine how to talk about notions of time, space, and those sorts of things. Again, that context that our ancestors naturally learned that by has changed. And so we need new tools to be able to do that. And the materials that we produce. There's both printed and of course technology is starting to become more prevalent. I don't believe that technology is going to save our language, but I think the thoughtful use of it will in fact help us. And so we have to be thoughtful about how we use technology. The materials that we produce have different purposes. Sometimes they're designed to be fit into programs. Sometimes they're designed just to be consumed by the community. Anytime that we publish or print materials, one is sent to every tri tribal household automatically. They don't have to ask for it. It's the commitment that the tribe has to make sure that whatever we're producing is shared with the wider community. This one here is one of our most recent publications. It's a collection of about 40 traditional narratives, um, much of which are part of our uh, winter storytelling cycle. And we spent about 15 years doing the translation work on that particular text. And before we published it, we had the conversation, is the community ready for this? Because what we didn't want the community to do is to treat, treat their traditional stories as if they were bedtime tales for children, which some of them may have done. Instead, what we needed to do is try to prepare the community to receive what hasn't been told for a long time as their traditional stories. For them to understand that these stories are important, they reflect people, they teach us things, and they cause us to think, and they deal with both the known and the unknown. So it was at the launch of this publication that we started our storytelling cycle, which had been dormant for probably 70 some years. It was an important transitional point, but one that took about 15 years of work, kind of like a garden. You have to kind of clear that garden, get some of the weeds out before you start planting those seeds, hoping those seeds will be fruitful. So it's not just about language. For us, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that folds into our Earth and Sky curriculum was our first attempt to deal with the topic of science. Science through the lens of our own culture and language. That took us about four or five years to develop that one piece because we had some ideas in mind, we had some models, teaching models, but we needed to try them out, we needed to assess and see how the children responded to them. Are they getting the ideas? Are they realizing that for us landscape is a three-dimensional space? that the stars are just over there. They're not understood to be miles and miles and miles away, even though we know they are today. But for our ancestors, they talked about the stars as if they were part of their near landscape. Dictionaries. This was our first printed dictionary. Can you learn a language from a dictionary? How many think you can learn a language from a dictionary? Oh, very good. <laughs> you can learn some things from a dictionary. Why did we print the dictionary? People laugh when I tell them this. To prove to our tribal community that our language was a real language. That it didn't need a hyphen after every syllable. That the translations were challenging because it reflected a real distinct culture 
And so when tribal members got our first student dictionary and looked at it, they were pretty blown away. That's the effect we wanted to have. We wanted them to start to think about this effort as being real. Because there were a lot of tribal members on the fence. Because think about the messaging that we were getting 15 years ago. Languages are extinct. Languages are dead when they lose their speakers. Well, that's a nice try, Daryl, but you're probably not gonna be successful. And so we had to prove to them that this was a real effort. And again, it's taken years. People who didn't participate years ago are now going to bat for us. And some of those are elders, elders who are skeptical that we could bring our language back. It wasn't until they started hearing the children speak. It wasn't until they started seeing the mass amounts of materials that we're putting out and the effect that language and culture revitalization is having on the community that they were finally convinced that this is real and it should be done. And there is absolutely no way to talk about this without community. Testing. Again, without the people, there's no point. And without the people wanting to have language and culture as part of their everyday lives. Not a school language, not a program language, but language and culture that becomes part of who they are as they carry out their lives on a daily basis. The way we work with our community is in this way. We have developed a series of formal infrastructure that begins to handle and deal with the things that are important to us. We just recently established an education office. It's taken us this long for the community to be convinced that tribal education is worth putting tribal funds into and tribal resources into. And that just happened in January of this year. We are very, very pleased. That's a milestone. That's a huge milestone that marks success for us. We are, get, we are getting our community to realize how important this is. The educational office will handle all the pro pro programmatic issues that deal with community programs, language in the home, anything that we need, they're there. They currently have two staff to get us started. The cultural resource office has been there for years and for the most part has been handling community programs, but because they deal with such a vast amount of uh, issues, including historic preservation, NAGPRA issues, and a whole host of other things, uh, they're pretty inundated. But I would say that the relationship within the community is glued together by this office. This is the office that really is the visual representation of, of the formal side of, of our culture for the community. The Miamia Foundation. The Miamia Foundation was established several years ago and has slowly morphed into a funding agency for tribal members as a way to encourage tribal members to practice their culture, to explore it, to represent it in art, to continue some of the research. And so the foundation was put in place to encourage individuals. And what's powerful about that is it allows individuals to step forward with their own skills, talents, and interests to participate. They don't have to be part of a for formal program. And the Miamia Center, which started as a Miamia project in 2001, just became a center in 2013. It is really the research arm of this office. So we conduct a lot of the research that's necessary. We also develop the educational materials and we do the teacher training. We are going to be establishing uh, teacher training certificates in the next few years and those will be handled through the educational office. So all of these offices, all of these initiatives, all these efforts um, really work together. The Miamia Center is unique. It's unique because it's a tribal initiative within an academic setting. We have a 40-year relationship with Miami University. It dates back to the 1970s. Sometime in the mid-1990s, we realized that such a small tribe in Oklahoma, we just simply didn't have the resources 
to really begin to affect language and cultural education. So we turned to our friends at Miami University and said, would you help us? And they said, well, what do you want to do? We said, well, we want to develop an on-campus program that allows us to tap into the resources of a university for the benefit of the community. And the only thing we asked for were two things, that all of the research initiatives would be driven by the tribe or by this office, and that anything we publish would be copyrighted by the tribe, which is an intellectual property rights issue. We felt very strongly that our ancestors' intellectual knowledge should remain with the community and not with the university. And we also felt that academic interest should, ne should never supersede community need. So those were two important elements. So in 2001, we created the Meow Meow Project, and that has become probably the most important uh, initiative that we've created. The tribe pays for all the operating costs of the Meow Meow Center and also pays for some of the base salaries. The university kicks in some benefit funds and provides us space. So it is a huge financial commitment on behalf of the tribe to have the Meow Meow Center. But it also ensures that the Meow Meow Center will see to the needs of the community. Our leaders should be servant leaders. They were in the past, and we encourage that practice to this very day. We choose to work very, very closely with our tribal leaders to help them understand, to make them feel like they're part of the team. And we've been successful at doing that. We have tremendous leadership support. But I will say that that has come with a lot of effort and a lot of work. Educating them about why language and culture is important, why our youth identity should be shaped by the tribe, and a whole host of other things. And there's really no easy way to say this, but this takes money. Several years ago when I started my own personal effort, I had the opinion that, well, it doesn't take money to speak my language at home. And it doesn't. Any of you can speak your language, work with your children, extended family. That doesn't take money. But if you want to do community programming, that takes funds. If you want to be involved in your own research, that takes funds. So I very quickly learned that if this was ever going to be outside of my home, and a more community-wide effort that we were going to need a financial resource. Economic development didn't really start happening for us until the mid-1990s. And it was at that time that we began to establish fun uh, funding streams that would continue to support language and cultural education. <clears throat> we make very little use of grants. Grants are very, very difficult for a community like us what funding is out there uh, tends to go towards communities that still have speakers, tends to go towards communities who demonstrate that they will do immersion programming. So for a community like ours, funding is even tighter and really not worth much our time. So we don't make a lot of use out of grant funds. And I think we're very good at building relationships. This is our former chief, Tom Gamble, with our university president, uh, Dr. Hodge, David Hodge. And I would say that when I came to the university, one of the things tribal leaders told me is, you're not there to change the system. You're there to do the work that we've sent you there to do. If by doing that work, the system changes, that's okay, but you're not there to change the system. And so, at being on campus, we still consider ourselves guests there. And we don't involve ourselves with university politics. We're simply there to do the work that we do. But from that, we have built some really, really close, dependable relationships, not only with institutions, but also with some researchers. There's some researchers out there that we've worked with for many years. They're not from our community, uh, but we rely on them pretty heavily. They are very, very important to our effort, and we continue to nurture those relationships. 
So relationship is very, very fundamental. Our greatest resource for language and cultural education has to be our own people. A wing dingy, a wing dingy, a wing dingy is what we say. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Sustaining life is about maintaining respectful relationships. Communal health hinges on our ability to work together in a unified direction. Language and cultural education has brought us together. It helps us heal and teaches us how to treat each other better. We respond to this need in relationship building. Okay, so this is really, if you will, the engine that drives what we do today. Those are the main components. Research, education, community. We don't have a language program. We don't have a language committee. Language is not a thing. It is embedded within our research effort because we do have to continue to transcribe, translate, and build the materials. But instead, what we have is a growing educational effort by which language gets infused in everything. Language gets infused in everything. It's not a program. It's very important for tribal leaders to not see language as a program. It's our future. Don't treat our language as a program. It's our future. By not having language as a program, there's no target. There's no place to pull funding on. Our language now exists and is being perpetuated in lots of different realms. You can't pull the plug on language right now for us. Somebody described it as releasing the ants. <laughs> there's no way to, st to stomp on all the ants because there's too much out there and it's spread out. And that's, that's really how language has to be pervasive in the community. What I'd like to do now is just change direction, and I'd like to talk specifically about some outcomes. So as this is all taking place, what are we seeing in the youth and in the community? What is an outcome? That's what I want to share with you now. And I'll wrap up the presentation with this. The first thing I want to talk about is Kiluna Mia Miaki, we are Miami. This is an issue of identity, identity formation. This has become a very, very powerful force we're seeing among the youth generation. The way in which youth connect to language, the way in which youth connect to each other, to their community, and understand their culture, all of those things kind of go together. It's one package. It can begin very, very early, in the home, and I'm going to play a short clip of two of my children. Um, at the time, my youngest daughter was about three, and my older daughter uh, liked to do drawings and, and cartoons, and she would make little books to read to her younger sister. And this is how language started for them. One of the things I didn't realize at the time, but that when children are exposed to language, even me as a second language learner, if I can expose them, my wife and I, to the language, they can become better speakers than I. How's that possible? I still see it today. I will always be a second language learner. And so when I speak to them in the language, their response time is half mine. When they speak to me in the language, I have to think about how to respond to them. And so I think it is possible, if children are given the opportunity at a very, very young age, to be immersed in whatever language you can provide to them, whatever stage of language development your community's in, it can, you can produce something that's just a notch ahead, essentially, of where second language learners are. 
I don't consider them to be second language learners. Language has always been part of their life. It hasn't been complete enough yet because for a community like ours, it's gonna take us at least three generations to be able to develop enough of a language to be able to create the kinds of immersion programming we hope to do in the future. But without speakers, the process becomes much longer. But it doesn't mean that we can't get started and we can't begin moving towards that. I see our effort as an evolving fluency, not an immediate fluency that comes with immersion programming. What that does is it allows the community time to be part of the process and to go with us. The other thing I didn't mention at Miami University was that uh, they provide scholarships for our tribal youth. And this year we'll have the greatest number of tribal youth uh, on campus, 24. And they come there under a Miami Indian Heritage Award. And as part of that Heritage Award, they're required to take a series of courses in Miami language, culture, ecological perspectives, history, and modern issues. And that, youth, that group, that college-aged uh, youth group, is really bonding over that experience. We find that the youth want access to their language and culture, and they want to be able to develop a degree of fluency in it. Aya, Haley Wings were on and Nehini La Miamia. To Pewe, Neo Laka Koke Cheke, Oaha, Nehi Pe Kake Isha Sengi. Misha Kanakwa, Nehi Takamwa, Ewe Makeke. We are Ane, we are Pitrake Onge, we are Anjamachi Kate, Neo Lane, Wapanje. I don't mind showing clips of young people struggling to speak because we are struggling, it's a reality. And it's okay to struggle and they know that. They're not intimidated by the struggle. They've accepted that struggle's part of this process and they're okay with it. There's not much shyness. This is also the generation that is really beginning to take off of social media. So we have a Twitter account now that is almost entirely in Miami. This is how the young people are starting to communicate. They've accepted that the language is theirs, and we've asked them to move forward with it. The last couple of years, we've really started to think about assessment. And we've really, this is again, part of that process where we look back at the youth and, and see what we can learn. And there's some interesting thing that's coming out. We're actually gonna be putting the publication out probably in the next year through the faculty affiliates that we have working through the center. Because what's emerging from this work is indicating some things we didn't expect. Miami tribe students tend to see their identity more aligned with Miamia community and culture than with genetic or racial identifiers. Tribal students struggle with the difference between a socially constructed model of a Native American race and their emerging understanding of Miamia culture and heritage. In a survey question with tribe students that are exposed to this effort, we asked them, what do you most identify with? American Indian, Native American, Miamia, other. None of them picked Native American or American Indian. It's a racial identity. It's one that we have no control over. What gets defined as an Indian in this country doesn't belong to any one group. And for most of our young people, the stereotypes that are associated with that, they can't identify with anyhow. Language and cultural revitalization forces us as a community to define ourselves as a community. That is an identity that we do in fact have control over. We get to control what it means to be Miami, or at least the community as a whole does, defines what that is. And it's easier for our tribal youth to connect to that than it is to things that they have no control over. It also allows us to shape that in a positive light, in the kind of way in which it's contributing back to the community and they treat each other better. The other thing we looked at was graduation rates. We are finding that language and cultural education has direct benefits 
to academic achievement. When we compare tribal student graduation rates between those students who came to Miami University without the benefit of language and cultural classes versus the past 10 years when those opportunities were available, graduation rates pre-language classes were 52% and the current graduation rate is 75%. Now, I don't think that's all just language. Again, language is not a thing. It's the larger effort. It's that larger piece that we're trying to put together, which is embedded with language, that is giving them a solid foundation. It is giving them confidence and allowing them the opportunity to be successful in life. And I would say that's the number one selling point to the general public, but also to our tribal leaders, is that Academic success is connected to language and cultural education. I'm going to let uh, Julie Olds, who's our cultural resource officer and has been for many years, uh, talk a little bit about the effects on community, community rebuilding, community strengthening. The things that we can measure, you know, from where we were even 10 years ago to where we are now, it's amazing the things that have come back and that have been uh, revitalized and just renewed, you know, the sense of community and, and relation. Prior to the return of language, there would be maybe, you know, 35, 40 people at, a, at an annual meeting. And now um, an annual meeting has 150 voting members who bring their family, you know, we've got 300, 300, 350 people in the room, you know, because of, I believe, personally believe, because of the return of, of the language. The level of group energy that has come out of our effort has really, I think, completely reshaped the community. There is a real power in that experience. This is a, one of our uh, groups at the a one office. <laughs> This effort has created unity and camaraderie. We've been able to revitalize some of our traditional games like Pakataha Mengi and Makasene Mekindinge, the moccasin game, Senze Wingi, the bowl game. A lot of our games have been revitalized uh, primarily through the youth. And all of these things come together and just create an incredible energy. So community rebuilding is really one of the major outcomes of this effort. And probably the last thing, which isn't really surprising for me, is the ecological piece. As Miami people, our culture is ecologically based. Traditional ecological knowledge serves as the basis for our understanding of place and our purpose within that place. Language and cultural education requires us to strongly connect to the seasonal and natural processes that surround us, relationships, foods, communal celebrations, medicines, and the many responsibilities outlined in our winter stories are contextualized when we engage our language and culture in non-human constructed environments. Nahimbito Senewingi means to live in a good way. This is how we describe the general well-being or health from our own philosophical understanding. The sustainability of our natural resources requires us to live in a good way. We cannot afford to continue damaging our homes and it's due to this reality that we are focusing on developing traditional ecological knowledge of our youth and connecting that effort to sustainable food systems to combat much of our modern illnesses. Our real approach to education is intended to be exploratory, to not deal with modern things like clocks and time. We put these kids in an environment where they can explore the world in the context of their language and culture. They leave the electronics at home. They leave the candy at home. 
and it works very, very well. We've been running this program since 2005, and again, the amount of sharing, bonding, and knowledge that these youth are coming away with in terms of ecological knowledge is, is really profound. Harvesting traditional plants, being in the kitchen, help preparing those, uh, all of those are an integral part of it. So much so that in the Miamia Center, we created a cultural ecology office so that we could focus directly on the continued development of traditional ecological knowledge. That will be a big part of our future effort. In closing, I'd like to share a line from our origin story. Nipingonji newe osa chiki muki chiki. Pema tana kwake sa kwake lo ileti chiki. Nehe sa kate we chiki nungi nyaha imenu te chiki. The first ones emerged from the water. Grab a hold of tree limbs, they told each other, and they came out. Then they formed a village there. I wanted to share this line because it metaphorically represents something very important to our current work in language reclamation. Throughout our human history, there have been moments of significant struggle, forcing us to reemerge, sometimes in new places and with new identities. Some of us believe we are emerging into one of these periods at this time. Reemerging is difficult. And as the story demonstrates, we have to help each other. We cannot do it alone. Our collective efforts to grab a hold of our language in whatever form we find it will allow us to reemerge into the present and help us maintain our distinctiveness. I cannot tell you what that will look like into the future any more than our ancestors could have predicted their future after their emergence. I cannot tell you how long it will take for us to reach a moment in time when we're healthy again, a time when our languages are strong and our people know who they are and are no longer afraid to be Miamia. The work we are carrying out today is only a foundation for a future generation. I believe our language will continue to expand and someday, probably long after I'm gone, we will move into a time of day where the sun is higher in the sky the cranes are much more abundant, and maybe by then our wikiami will have a covering to protect us. Mission Newe Nepoakolo. I'm happy to take a few questions. If not, I will be around for the day I have... Oh, there's one back there. We don't have that worked out yet. What we've done is we've hand-selected for this summer, starting this summer, three individuals that are going to make up the core of that. Um, when it comes to those sorts of things, we do tend to hand-select individuals who either show a very strong interest or have been involved with the program for a long time and show an aptitude for it. So, but I, I assume over time that will develop to where there's a selection process of some kind. I was just wondering if you've used any, any other efforts to help guide you, like the, re, um, the revitalization of Hebrew and it was a very political um, project on the fact, um, on the part of the Israeli nation. But now there are generations, there are children that speak it as a native language. I do a fair amount of traveling and I'm generally aware of lots of different efforts, including the Hebrew effort. And I think we do draw on those when we can. One of the things that I've, I've come to realize is, even within Indian country itself, I, I know we all share an American experience, but the outcomes of that experience have left tribes in very different situations in terms of their resources and what they can do. So there's a lot of good work going on out there. I can honestly say that in the last 10 years, I've really seen a real bump up in activity, younger people getting involved, teachers getting trained. So I'm really, really encouraged by that. 
but yeah, I think that through sharing and being aware of each other's efforts that there's a lot to be learned. But there isn't a silver bullet out there. I haven't seen it yet anyhow. Yeah, hey, my question is, uh, how is the traditional ethnological knowledge connected with the, the writing system? With our current modern orthography, our writing system? I guess one of the things I argue is when you talk about an indigenous knowledge system, or in this case, uh, traditional ethnological knowledge, much of that knowledge is grounded in non-written indigenous knowledge uh, language. I'm trying to understand how you tie your knowledge system to Miami language. Well, I think you're right. Writing is secondary. It's not primary. Knowledge doesn't come just from writing. I think it's very, very difficult for me because I think what a lot of communities who still have speakers, who are actively practicing their culture in ecological situations, cannot understand how, without those speakers, you can derive something like traditional ecological knowledge from documentation. Is that right? Am I close? So the answer to that question is, it takes time, it reshapes itself over time. There is a lot to learn from the language, but it forces us in many ways to reinvent. I cannot say that what we have today is what our ancestors had 300 years ago. That's not possible. What we do have today is an understanding, and what we will do is what every generation has done to do the best we can with what we have. There is no doubt that communities that have lost their speakers have a huge task ahead of them. But I would say, based on my own experience, there's a lot you can do, there's a lot you can learn, there's a lot you can revitalize, and there's a lot you can practice again in terms of your culture and language that doesn't require writing. So I don't know if I answered that very well, but that's the best I can do under these circumstances. Um, I'm curious how st you started with your family and your children. How did the other youth start getting involved? How long did that take? And what was it that sparked their interest? Why don't we ask one? <laughs> did you get that? Any quick tape and go with Chilami on it? Yep, yellow. I'm going to introduce you to George Ironstrack. George now works as the education coordinator and assistant director of the Miamia Center. Uh, he was in high school uh, when we started our program, so I think through his eyes you'd get a better response. Hey, Winika. I was hoping to sit quietly during all this and just listen. Um, I think the answer to that question is different for each of the youth who got involved in the 90s and those who have gotten involved since. Um, for myself, uh, my father um, grew up without the language. And as Daryl was beginning to revitalize in his own home, it became known in the community that someone was teaching the language. It was phrased that way in mysterious terms. Someone was teaching the language in their home. And a lot of people of my father's generation wanted to know what happened to their language because um, his father couldn't explain it to him. His father had passed real time I was around. And so my father started to learn and he brought that knowledge home. And I honestly cannot explain why it sparked something within me, a deep interest. It was meeting a need that I didn't even know I had and um, began to quite naturally fall into the classes that were taking place at the community level. Um, they were very informal. And as Daryl pointed out, some of the outcomes that we're learning are about increased emotional stability, um, assurance of your own identity and your own place in your community. I wasn't aware of those things, but I think now in hindsight that the language was meeting a lot of those needs internally for me, and it just fed um, the fire inside of me to continue. Anyway. Okay. 
Well, I was just asked to say a little bit about my children and how they're doing with the language. My older two are now, my wife's gonna look at me to make sure I get this right, 23 and 22. My oldest daughter just got married last year. And I always wondered that when we left home, either went to college or went home with their lives, if they'd be able to maintain the language. I've learned since then that it is difficult to maintain if you're not around other people who use the language. So like at college, it was challenging for my older two to use the language. But my son recently just got hired by the tribe under a two-year contract to be a language instructor. And so he's going to be doing a lot of that work. I've encouraged him to be involved in immersion programming through his college education. He's got a degree in uh, anthropology. And so he's been exposed to a number of different languages that he learned in immersive settings. My hope is that he's gonna be a very different teacher than I am. He's gonna connect with the generation a little bit more solidly than I will. And um, so that's what he's doing. My daughter is one of the three uh, teachers that have been selected to be the core of the teacher training program that we're going to initiate. So she um, works during the summertime with our youth programs. You know, there's an old saying, you gotta grow your own. And I think that's very true. And for youth that have been involved with their communities, connected to their heritage, their language, their cultures, they tend to contribute more back to the community. And I had always hoped that would happen. My younger two are still fairly young. They're 16 and 14. And um, they learned the language a little bit differently than the older two did. Actually, a lot of the language they got from their older siblings. They were in more of an immersive environment because our language, my wife and I's language use, was more advanced by the time they came along. So they got it into a more immersive environment. They tend to just use it. They don't write it very well. And it's just part of life. They don't think about it much. There's, I could spend a lot of time talking about the process of children in the home and how they go back and forth between English and, for our case, Meow Meow, how they try to divert the language they're learning and how we shut those avenues off. You know, we have, a, we have a saying in our community that the adults want culture and history and the children don't really care, right? They're gonna give us, they're gonna get what we give them. And that's true. I don't mean that in a negative way and I don't mean it in a forceful way, but in our home, language was required, it was not an option. And it had to be that way. So we did not allow the kids to not use the language. They had to use it. So. Would you please give a nice round of applause again for their body? I think, um, and the case with the, the Miami language and in particular uh, Daryl Baldwin's family is very reminiscent of other programs or other efforts in language revitalization that started at the family uh, and community level and has expanded from there is a very nice nice model. One thing that to me is very striking about his though or theirs is that affili affiliation with the university and universities are institutions, no matter how, how uh, large or small they might be, they're still very difficult places to make inroads when it comes to language efforts. Um, and I, I speak from uh, experience here in, in the state of Arizona, we have three major universities, but of course, you know that the state of Arizona also has very significant and important um, native languages, uh, traditional people represented, in particular the Navajo, which is you know the, the, the largest uh, in the country, and the Tohono O'odham Nation, which is also a significant uh, group. Um, the Hopi, which is a, a small tribe, but a very important tribe uh, in the state. And we're spread out from the, the northern end of the state all the way down here to the southern part and we, we are uh, sitting close to large institutions like this one, but um, still in this day and age, when it comes to 
issues of language, language and culture and history of the people of the state, we, we still struggle to, to make inroads into these institutions. So that's a, you know, sort of a, a unique model that they have with the um, collaboration and partnership that they have with a campus near them. So that's, uh, like I said, very different uh, in a sense. And of course, the Hawaiian one is, is also an important model and has a long history and also has a very strong foot uh, at their campuses as well. Uh, but that's not for everyone. Um, uh, it's something that you know evolves over time. So let's see, we have some time this morning. Um, so I'm gonna do some announcements uh, for all of you. Uh, there's a yellow sheet.